Good morning. Um, I'd like to, today we have uh, Dr. Puzan here to explain common eye problems to us. I would like to thank him for coming, taking time out of his busy schedule to be with us this morning. Dr. Puzan practices medical and surgical ophthalmology with offices in Summit and Roselle. He's a diplomat of the American Board of Ophthalmology. He graduated from the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine and his residency was at New York Ear and Eye Infirmary. His practice includes cataract surgery, treatment of glycoma, macular degeneration, primary angle closure, glaucomia, and retinal detachments. Dr. Buzan. Uh, thanks, George, so much for having me uh, here today. It's uh, great to see all, all you men here at, together. Uh, this, uh, Really, hopefully I can uh, brighten your day with some uh, pictures of ophthalmology and some uh, educational tips in such a gloomy day. But first of all, it's, it's great for me to see all you men together, you know, sort of a membership and camaraderie <clears throat> to be here, gosh, every week. I think it's just fantastic. My wife has a book group that meets sort of casually once a month. They usually meet for two hours and they talk for about an hour and 45 minutes on social events. And someone says, well, we got to do something in the last 15 minutes. And then they talk about the book and then they end it. But really appreciate and really respect your commitment and camaraderie together. Uh, so far, let me, uh, I'm an, uh, an ophthalmologist, which is the eye doctor. I'm not an optometrist. I have an MD degree. I do sur perform surgery. Uh, an optician is the one who makes the glasses. Optometrists refract and also prescribe contact lenses. And in some states, and especially in Jersey, they can prescribe medicines and do small procedures. But you really wanna put your money on an ophthalmologist who has all the uh, training and care and expertise in treating pathology. Uh, that's who we should go to. Hopefully today I'll stimulate you to get a regular eye exam so we can prevent diseases from occurring and also prevent some diseases from getting too serious um, and so forth. Uh, vision is so important to us, it's pretty much 95% of our sensory input. The rest is hearing, and then last but not least, probably taste and touch. But uh, eyesight is so important for our in independence as we get older, especially if we're uh, uh, living alone and so forth. So let's, uh, I'll give some uh, talks on specific topics of ophthalmology. And uh, I think I have like five or six, you know, lectures. Uh, yeah groups, and maybe I'll ask just uh, allow some questions after each one rather than wait to the very end. Uh, <clears throat> if you can't hear me, just tell me to speak up, and uh, let's get going. Uh, initially, yeah, uh, I care for people our age. Uh, it's great with ophthalmology, a great picture to show the eye. Uh, that just keeps your attention. I have some graphs here. It's not, not really pictures, so I'll try and go over them pretty quickly so I can keep your attention. <clears throat> Obviously, the U.S. population of 65 and older is really increasing. So it's going to increase so much by the year 2030 and 2050. So, um, of course, um, most disease of our entire body increases with uh, increasing age. So I'll talk about the uh, diseases that are very prevalent to uh, senior citizen population. Uh, about people our ages, we have multiple chronic illnesses, medications, uh, adverse reactions to the drugs, you know, functional and, and cognitive uh, limitations. And I want to talk about the importance of uh, family and, and social supports. The uh, goal of geriatric care is to improve functional abilities, such as you know, driving, you know, cooking, shopping, you know, reading, uh, uh, communication, comprehension. Uh, we always try to avoid atrogenic illnesses, which are illnesses we create ourselves or the medical uh, team uh, creates, unfortunately, for the patient. Uh, a lot of people involved, not just me, but internists, uh, family practice people, general surgeons, uh, internal medicine people, family members, social services and support. Okay. All the patient assessment. Actually, I don't really need to go over this. Um, but the importance uh, and with, with vision, how it ties into it is doing a lot of studies now in terms of what's the quality of life? How can we measure that? And they're trying to measure that in terms of what does eye diseases can affect quality of life. Quality of light, as I said before, they're talking about driving during the day, driving at night, cooking your own meal, being able to shop, your memory, uh, reading comprehension, reading speed, uh, in order to be up to date with uh, 
communication online, text messages, email, and so forth. So the, what are the big diseases in ophthalmology that can affect that quality of life? Sure, anything that decreases vision. That would be cataract. Thank God that's reversible. And uh, <clears throat> pretty much everyone, uh, everyone in this country gets pretty much access to excellent uh, cataract surgery today. But we also have to talk about diseases that are really tough to treat, like glaucoma. It takes your peripheral vision, usually before your central vision. That disease we can stop, it's very hard to reverse. Other one would be you know, macular degeneration. <clears throat> There's a wet form and the dry form. The dry form is pretty much 90% of the case. And I'll show some slides later. But we really can't reverse that. The wet form, we can. I'm sure people have heard of intraocular injections of medicine to uh, prevent that. Uh, also, we want to prevent you know, people with diabetes. So many people, I say, get older have diabetes, and that can decrease vision in the retina, bleeding and retinal detachment. So we want people to be functional and trying to measure that in terms of quality of life and trying to uh, see how we can treat these ophthalmic diseases to improve and maintain uh, your quality of life. Okay, maintain, I think I did that one already. Okay, again, activity of daily living uh, and so forth. Uh, this is sort of boring, but uh, the important thing is one in three may face some visual loss by age 65. Daily activities can be curtailed, social isolation, you know, psychiatric you know, depression, uh, and so forth, less mobility, increased falls and fractures, and loss of independent living. At so tough, I have a bunch of patients who live alone and they're legally blind and they can't drive. You know, they can't go to the store and get their, their groceries. Uh, they have to rely on a friend or family member to, to pick them up and drive them all the time, go to their doctor's appointments. And it's just a uh, real, uh, it's difficult, okay? Aging the crystalline lens, that is the cataract, which means the waterfall. You know, it can, it's, uh, there are different types. Uh, the nuclear sclerotic one is usually yellow, then it can turn sort of an ochre or brown, makes vision dim, color vision is dim, uh, nighttime vision is, is uh, decreased. Uh, it can also change your, your, your refractive power, your, uh, your glass power. Uh, posterior subcapsule gives you a lot of glare. You know, I can't uh, drive at night, the bright sunlight bothers me. If you have a posterior subcapsular cataract, today's the perfect day for you because it's so cloudy. Those people like those people that cataract like this kind of day. Nobody else does. Uh, also, we lose the ability to focus up close, which is presbyopia. That occurs a little bit earlier, usually around age 45 or so. Uh, systemic disease can affect the eye. Uh, hypertension is a risk factor, especially in men. Uh, this hardening of the artery, which can compress on the retinal vein because they cross each other in the retina. And also in the vein can close off and cause hemorrhage, bleeding and decreased vision. Uh, diabetes causes uh, leaking of, of fluid and also of blood. It also causes new blood vessels to grow, which can lead to a retinal detachment, which again is very, very hard to treat. Uh, glaucoma is usually high pressure of the eye, but it can also be a normal pressure. We think there's just not enough blood flow to the eye to maintain the health of the optic nerve. With uh, neural tissue, uh, it doesn't regenerate like skin or muscle. If it gets cut or bruised, it can heal, but an optic nerve really can't. Okay, we talked, I did talk about age-related macular degeneration. I'll show some pictures later. Glaucoma, cataract, and diabetes. Okay. So this stuff you really don't need uh, to know. Uh, how, how often should someone be examined? Uh, someone's very healthy at 65 and over, usually every one or two years. A lot of time is screening for macular degeneration or, or glaucoma can occur. Usually most people are age of 60, 65. Uh, usually when patients come in with symptomatic vision loss, a lot of times the disease they have is, is more advanced and we'd like to see, so you want to keep them earlier. So routine uh, exams, just like routine, you know, colonoscopy, routine exam for high blood pressure, diabetic check with internists are very, very helpful. Okay. This is just simple stuff. Uh, this is the pictures, hopefully I'll get your attention now. Uh, the upper eyelashes are uh, blepharitis, usually from um, gram-positive bacteria. I can cause dry eye, can cause rosacea, uh, foreign body sensation, blurring. Cosmetically, you don't like it. Uh, now position of the lids, you see these lower lids here, they can turn in, which is entropy, which can scratch the eye, blurry vision, foreign body sensation. Uh, these are functional uh, diseases that are easy to treat makes the uh, ocular comfort uh, better, a uh, better vision and less chance of serious illness like a corneal ulcer from the damaged corneal surface from the eyelashes with its bacteria rubbing against it. Uh, if it turns in, it's entropian in. When it turns out, this is ectropian. It's like having a pair of pants that are too baggy. So what we do is we have to tighten the belt 
to make an incision laterally and tighten that lid so it can oppose the globe. This, uh, hey, now the, uh, the, the cornea is exposed uh, and also the lower lid is a mucous membrane. So that turns out that will form a lot of mucus and uh, mucous membranes, which are just irritating and uh, unsightly to say the least. Ptosis is droopy lids. A lot of people don't realize it, but uh, here the right eye is droopier than the left eye, but they're both droopy. The, the levator muscle, which elevates the eyelid, can come off with age, with time, and all of a sudden it's like pulling the curtain down on your window, you can't see. So we can do a procedure under local anesthetic where we reattach that levator muscle to reattach the lid to elevate them both. So in this case, I would do the right eye first because that's the lowest one. And then a couple of weeks later, I would do the left eye. Not only is it a cosmetic improvement, but also a uh, functional improvement that increases your visual field. This guy is probably lifts his chin up to drive. You know, he probably falls asleep reading. And is, uh, a lot of times I see people with ptosis don't even know they have it. Uh, other things that are important are uh, skin cancers, especially the lower lid because the sun is coming up from above. You can see that curly uh, pink lesion with the uh, uh, strand uh, ribbon of blood vessels there. Uh, the arrow points to the, the tear duct where the tears drain. The skin cancer is to the left of that. Uh, and that's the basal cell. It's, you know, it is a tumor. It doesn't really metastasize. And we can excise that, return the function of the lid to it and, and also cure the cancer. Coronal damage, uh, here's a case of a severe dry eye. People don't realize dry eye can also cause uh, an ulcer and uh, loss of tissue of the cornea. And here, uh, you can see right in the center, uh, there's a little, uh, little dark spot where there's, uh, the cornea is so thin, it's ready to perforate. And that's a uh, ophthalmic emergency. So dry eye, someone who has longstanding rheumatoid arthritis, uh, lupus, uh, scleroderma, even uh, psoriasis. Uh, this important one, this is your, your classic, your herpes zoster, uh, ophthalmicus, the quote unquote shingles. You don't get chicken pox as a child, but it, re <coughs> it occurs uh, usually uh, anywhere in the body. The most common area is the lower back. And then the second most common is around the eye. This is what we call the V1 distribution. Uh, when it goes along the nose, it can also affect the cornea. It damages the nerves. And the nerves in the cornea are important to say, hey, listen, I'm dry. Tear ducts you know, produce more tears. And when that uh, feedback mechanism is damaged, the cornea can become dry, uh, damaged, and we can get a situation like this. Oh, wrong way. So this is we treat uh, with oral antivirals. I even put topical antivirals on the lesions because they are fresh and they have active virus until they crest over. And also give an antiviral drop to the eyes to prevent any corneal spread. Once you have it in the cornea, you have it for life. And the important thing is get the shingles vaccine. I have it. I hope everybody here has, has gotten the two shot vaccine. Because I've seen a few times where patients come into the office and the person said, you know, this happened to me uh, last week. You know, I happened to me today and I'm supposed to get my shingles vaccine you know, tomorrow or the next week. So uh, timing is everything. Age related macular degeneration. It's the most common cause of irreversible vision loss in the eye. Uh, I remember you just had to make the diagnosis only after eight, 55 years of age and older. Uh, risk factor, of course, advanced age. Family history is maybe 25% uh, transmissible. Uh, smoking is, uh, increases it because it gobbles up your antioxidants. And what happens is there's too much inflammation oxidation going on in the eye, which the body can't handle. And, those, uh, and so smoking is a bad one. And cardiovascular disease too, because it decreases the blood flow to the eye and delivering of antioxidants. If we look to the uh, far left, you see the medium-sized drusen. Those are like moth holes in the retina. What happens is the, the cells behind the retina, well, the, the cells, the rods and cones that give us our vision, um, light and dark, uh, they're constantly being turned over. So what happens is the body wants to recycle those rods and cones. So the, the, the skin below, it's called the RPE, recycles its force. But in macular degeneration, uh, the, the, the eye can't do that. Uh, there's too much inflammation going on. It's like you want to recycle, you know, all the, your 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 bottles and cans and cardboard. You put it out every uh, Monday, and then the garbage man doesn't come by. All that recycling, all that garbage picks up, and what happens is that becomes toxic to the retina and damages the retina cells underneath. Uh, there's a large drusen here, like around seven eight o'clock. Uh, 
and the eye. But the one on the far right, what happens is these drusen get larger and then they coalesce to become one sort of uh, solid mass. Uh, this is the dry form, which is usually 90% of macular degeneration. 10% is usually wet. Uh, the person on the left probably has 20-25 vision. The middle one has obviously has 20-20 vision. The one on the far right may have like 20-40 vision, but still able to drive and carry on every uh, day uh, activities of daily life. Uh, early AMD uh, is a small risk of advanced AMD. Uh, one eye intermediate AMD, one eye without AMD. It's about a 5% risk uh, to advance AMD in five years. I tell people, it's always in both eyes. You can't have it in one eye, not the other. Then it's not macular degeneration. Uh, certain risk factors are uh, the size of drusen, coalescence of drusen, uh, pigment clumping is a greater risk factor, uh, and so forth. Usually if one eye has advanced macular degeneration, it's either the dry form or the wet form, usually within five years, they have like a 40 to 50% chance of developing that advanced AMD in the other eye. Uh, all we can really do is take, uh, they call the A-reds vitamin, which have a lot of antioxidants, zinc, copper, uh, zeaxanthine, uh, uh, and vitamin C, except if you're a smoker. <laughs> I think they took out the vitamin C because of, uh, because of that. It has a slight increased risk of lung cancer. Okay, dry MD, atrophy of the photoreceptors, the rods and cones, gradual loss of vision. The wet macular degeneration is actually blood vessels grow through uh, underneath the retina. They break through the chain link fence the retina has, and it causes a decreased vision uh, and scarring. And it's a more sudden loss of vision. Uh, intermediate stage, you, know, you may not even know you have it. Advanced stage may have a central, blind, uh, a central blind spot in one eye. Some people don't realize they have it in one eye until they cover their good eye, and they realize they can't see out of the other eye. Here's an example of uh, the retina. We inject a little dye into the arm and it glows bright white here. Uh, you can see the optic nerve on the far right at three o'clock. You can see the blood vessels go superiorly and inferiorly. And in the center of that, there's two white areas that light up. That's the wet macular degeneration. That's the wet membrane underneath the retina that will damage the retinal uh, the cells, the rods and cones, will cause scarring. And then that's when you're left with a central blind spot. It's like putting your fist right in front of your eye. You can see around it, but you can't see through it. And the peripheral vision is, is quite limited. Uh, we have the Averitz vitamins, we talked about that. Uh, we really don't do, uh, how do we reduce the risk of vision loss in selected cases? Uh, really the, the way now, uh, we treat it now is we don't really use laser anymore. Uh, photodynamic therapy, we don't use much either, but it's really the VEGF drugs. Those are the injections you get once a month, which is, is a, which is a, like a weed color for blood vessels. It's an anti uh, endothelial growth factor, which is a blood vessel growth factor. Choose the injection every month. Sometimes you need five injections, sometimes you need more than 10 or 12 injections. We inject until it's completely dry, and then we sort of decrease the, the injection frequency from once a month, maybe every six weeks, and maybe every eight weeks. But uh, uh, you're going to the retina doctor essentially for life, just to check up on you. Uh, this is just a screen test, we don't have to do that. Uh, low vision aids come in when people have advanced macular degeneration, both eyes. There's a New Jersey Commission for the Blind that can help you with those uh, low vision aids uh, and so forth. Let's go on to something else, uh, glaucoma. Uh, second most common cause of visual loss in older people. Uh, Afro-Americans have a greater frequency, especially uh, they say here, they say here over the age of 70, but also over the age of 30, 35. For whatever reason, they seem to have a high risk of a very high pressure, very young in life. Uh, usually it's 2% of the population. I was told over the age of 60, here it is over the age of 70. Uh, early detection treatment can prevent blindness. It is the painless disease. You don't know you have it until it's gonna be very advanced. Uh, African American heritage, advanced age, family history. Uh, hypertension is a risk factor. We don't know why, but they're associated with it. Diabetes can be with uh, uh, ankle closure glaucoma. And people who are nearsighted myopia, they have very, very large eyes, maybe a few millimeters larger than the average eye. So their support system of the sclera uh, is weaker. The drainage area and the eyes like Swiss cheese. 
And with the myopic eye, which is thin, there's the Swiss cheese holes are smaller, so there's more resistance for the fluid to get out of the eye. Okay, uh, normal optic nerve on the right. It's like a donut hole, the small bagel, and there's a small hole in the center. You can see that bright yellow spot. And here's advanced glaucoma scupping where the whole cup is actually damaged and, and the blood vessels are collapsed to the periphery all the way around. This person, I'm sure, is legally blind. This is what we don't want to see. Primary open angle glaucoma uh, is, again, I'm not sure what causes it, but there's uh, less fluid draining from the eye, so the pressure increases. It's like if you pump up a basketball with air and none of it can leak out, you're just going to get higher pressure, which damages the optic nerve. Uh, again, it's usually high pressure over the age of, over the uh, amount of 20, 24 millimeters of mercury. There are also people who have a normal tension glaucoma, usually the older people over the age of 65, uh, they can have normal pressure, 18, 16. We think there's just not enough blood flow to the eye to, to support the health of the optic nerve. Angle closure is your acute glaucoma, you know, pain, blurry vision, nausea, vomiting, you know, wind up in the ER. And that's when angle closes off early. Those people are usually farsighted rather than nearsighted. Those people have diabetes, they're more prone to it. Uh, and that's an acute emergency. And uh, hopefully I don't see too many cases like that anymore, but uh, they'll rule in. Uh, a little anatomy real quick, primary open angle glaucoma, the, where the aqueous fluid flows, that's when there's little finger-like projections, that's a ciliary body. The fluid uh, uh, is produced there, it runs its way between the lens and that long finger-like projection is the iris. So it loops around there and then drains out that, that's purple area, that's where the Swiss cheese holes, holes are, where the fluid drains. And there's resistance in those Swiss cheese holes and that's where the pressure builds up and there's loss of uh, vision. Angle closure glaucoma occurs when the space between the iris and the lens gets too tight. And the fluid can't build up. It builds up behind it, pushes the iris closed to where that arrow is. And that's the acute form, uh, so forth. Glaucoma takes away your, uh, your peripheral vision before your central vision. So we do a visual field testing to measure that. We, and management is, all we can really do is lower the pressure. And that's with eye drops, laser, or surgery. You want to halt visual field loss, prevent further optic nerve damage because you can't really reverse it. All we can do again is lower the intraocular pressure and the different surgeries, uh, drops, uh, and so forth to do that. Angle closure is the acute form. Uh, thank God it's a minority of cases. Uh, usually people are either 50, female with, again, hyperopia, which is farsightedness, the opposite of myopia. And more common in some Asian groups, maybe just because of the anatomy of their eye uh, and so forth. Uh, again, here inside the fluid cannot get between the iris and the lens and the fluid builds up and it closes off that little drainage area uh, and so forth. You get uh, mid dilated pupil, you get a red eye, beet red, cloudy white, cloudy cornea, but severe pain, nausea and vomiting. That's a true uh, emergency. Here you can see where the pupil is a little bit larger than average. There's the injection of 360 degrees around the cornea and uh, the cornea there, it looks, uh, the blue iris, it's actually a little cloudy. Usually it can be <laughs> totally opaque. Okay, uh, we don't have to worry about the, uh, that uh, age-related cataract. Uh, what's nice about that is there's a very dense white cataract. That person can't see in and I can't see that and I can't see in. Uh, that's, that's a good cataract to remove. That's a difficult cataract to remove, but you love that. Uh, again, it's reversible. And you're, you're usually 95% of people retain at least 20, 40 vision or better. Uh, you need just 20, 50 vision in one eye to drive in the state of New Jersey. So uh, that really improves your vision very well. Near and distant vision problem, you know, uh, glare, trouble reading at night, anything that uh, affects your, your daily living uh, and so forth. Again, surgery, uh, to do surgeries, uh, uh, what the patient and I uh, have a common agreement that bothers the patient enough where he, he or she is unhappy. And I think the cataract is uh, bad enough and we agree to do the surgery. I don't try and convince them to do the surgery because it's, it's, it's an elective procedure and when they're ready, I'm ready. Actually, thank God there's no medical treatment for cataracts. If they're, yeah, they, they really take my business away. All right, Ivan. Okay. Uh, we have evaluation just with, uh, we have to have to get approval from your family, your doctor, your internist. Uh, 
you know, years ago, a lot of it was done under general anesthesia, where you give you injections behind the eye, retrobulbar anesthesia, or around the eye. Today, a lot of times, just give you a little intravenous sedation and a little topical anesthesia, like typical lidocaine, novocaine, and uh, we can do it that way. You're awake. Uh, a lot of times you fall asleep, you don't remember it, you're quickly done, you recover very quickly. We don't have to patch your eye. You can use your eye right away. You can blink your eye, which prevents infection. And also you can tell how your vision is improving. That's a big improvement uh, over the last 20 years uh, with uh, cataract surgery. Uh, some people are nervous and uptight, so I do give them a little peribulbar injection around the eye just to do it. But really, you're pretty much in a uh, semi-conscious state. You're never really knocked out anymore. Um, even though that lens is a cataract, it has power. It has about 20 diopters of power. Years ago, people wore the real thick Coke bottle glasses. Well, today, everybody gets the implant in the eye, so you don't need any glasses for a distance. They're very, very thin, low power glasses for that. That's probably the best improvement in, in, in uh, ophthalmic surgery uh, ever. Uh, in 90% received 20 40 vision or better. Rarely is there infection, rarely is there glaucoma, retinal detachment afterwards. Uh, sometimes people say, you know, I had my surgery two, three, four years ago, but I feel, doc, you know, my vision was great then, but now it's, it's getting cloudy again. It's my cataract growing back. It doesn't grow back. There is a few cataract cells that remain, maybe 0.001%. And they usually hide behind the periphery of the uh, uh, capsular bag behind the iris. For whatever reason, they migrate right in the center of vision, the pupillary axis, and they swell with water. They describe it as like dust on a coffee table. <laughs> So you get also you get symptoms like glare again outside, you know, trouble reading. We don't have to go back to the OR. We can just laser that thin membrane with a laser in the office and immediately your vision is better. Again, that may happen to really less than 10% of the patients. And usually years later, it doesn't happen right away. So that's something that uh, we can treat right in the office. Next thing is a diabetic retinopathy. So many of my patients are being diagnosed with diabetes, people in their 30s, 40s, 50s. So uh, they're picking it up early and they're just getting regular eye exams to make sure diabetes does not, it does not invade the eye. Uh, the lower you keep your blood sugar, the better chance you have of diabetes not affecting, affecting your eyes. Uh, how does diabetes work? Diabetes can do two things. It damages the blood vessel, so it doesn't necessarily bleed, but it leaks fluid. And the retina works like a dry sponge. When it's dry and thin, it works very well. When here we see here these little these golden rings called exudates, that's when the fluid leaks and the retina becomes a, a wet, thick sponge. And it gets distorted and that's what causes decreased vision. Not only it, it can be also be reversed, but also sometimes it can be irreversible. You always want to keep the retina dry. The best way to prevent this from happening is keep your blood sugar low. When people can't, what we can do here is we can do focal laser treatment uh, to dry up the laser, uh, to dry up the uh, edema, or you also can give injections that we give from wet macular degeneration, have these blood vessels dry up and shrink and stop leaking. That's the most common form, ma uh, diabetic macular edema. What happens is the blood vessels drop out in diabetes because they get clogged with the sugar and just damage from the cells that keep the retinal blood vessels healthy. So the retina all of a sudden goes, I don't get enough oxygen. So I need to grow new blood vessels to help me survive. These blood vessels are very haphazard, irregular, uh, and they're not the most mature vessels. So here they are growing off the, the optic nerve, and they're very fragile and they bleed. And that's like you know, the big fog and, and uh, driving your car at night. All of a sudden you really can't read, uh, your, your vision can be actually uh, legally blind. What happens is these blood vessels scar, which can also detach the retina, and that is a real problem. I don't do that type of surgery. The, the surgical uh, retinologist uh, does that. And this is what we want to prevent. In a case like this, we can laser the peripheral retina to decrease that lack of oxygen and also give injections, again, like wet macular degeneration, the VEGF medicines, AVAST, and the Lucentis, to try and uh, prevent the blood vessels from growing. It's like we need more weed color to stop the weeds from growing. Uh, and this is probably the biggest uh, complication of diabetic retinopathy. But uh, you know, 30 years ago when I started, there was a lot of this. Now today, the internists are really attacking diabetes before it becomes true diabetes. And I rarely see uh, this complication. Okay, again, internists and the diabetes, annual exam beginning five years after the diagnosis. 
Well, today, if you're diagnosed with diabetes early, call you pre-diabetic, you get an eye exam every year. Very simple. Uh, most of the time, they're a diet, exercise, and also the oral medicines. Uh, rarely, uh, I'll say most adults over the age of 30 don't need insulin. Insulin is usually for the, the uh, juvenile ones who are under the age of 30, and they're uh, teenagers or eight, nine years old who get it. Uh, those are the ones who usually on insulin all the time. But there are a few, a uh, fair amount of people, uh, adults on insulin, and whatever it takes to get your sugar down, that's what it takes. I mean, that's what you need. I mean, it's uh, to, to get a needle every day to check your blood sugar and give, give yourself another needle to give yourself insulin. I don't care who you are, that's a big change in lifestyle. So you really want to be able to uh, be in control of yourself. You don't need insulin. And so uh, exercise, diet, and take the oral medicines and really trust your, your endocrinologist, your internist, your family practice doctor. Retinal vein occlusions, uh, again, a sudden vision loss. They can be transient or permanent. It doesn't mean, uh, you know, a curtain's falling. It can just be cloudy. Also, it's fuzzy. You know, it got worse over four days. Now, you know, I close my good eye. I really can't drive with this eye. Let's try and show some pictures. The worst one is, is an embolus. This is a central retinal artery occlusion. The central retinal artery brings our blood to our retina. That closes off. The retina gets no oxygen. It's, it's ischemic. Instead of that beautiful... Hermes orange you see, uh, normal retina, this is white. This retina is all white. And in the center is that dark brown, we call it a cherry red spot. That means the whole retina has been damaged. If we can't find a, uh, an embolus, uh, usually it is from an embolus. Usually you find it from either the heart or from the carotid arteries. So if I see some with this situation, uh, I'll do a procedure in the office to try and put a needle in the eye to lower the pressure real quick. Because if there is an embolus, if I lower the pressure to zero for a second, it may push the endless further away from the central uh, vision, maybe reserve some of the artery. If your retina is ischemic for like an hour, it's dead after that. So it's really an emergency. Then we try and uh, I'll put them on an aspirin a day and I'll refer immediately to the emergency room because they have an increased risk of stroke. And also they need to work up for uh, an echocardiogram and a carotid Doppler. So I get the internist on that, but I send them uh, right to the uh, emergency room of the local hospital. Uh, here is just the lower portion of the uh, retina here. And that's a branch retinal artery occlusion. Again, that person will lose, since the lower retina sees the upper visual field, that person has a curtain splitting the retina. Again, uh, we try and uh, use it again in embolic sources for that. And we try and... Uh, See if there's a source of embolism. And otherwise, besides you know, doing a, a sticking a needle in the eye to lower the pressure, there's not really much we can do. Well, arteries give way to the vein. The arteries give blood to the eye. The veins take away blood out of the retina, uh, back to the heart. And those veins can close off. The central uh, retinal vein can close off or a branch retinal vein can close off. We call this the... Uh, 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 the uh, tomato ketchup appearance or the uh, thunder uh, in the storm appearance or also there's, there's hemorrhage all over the retina because the central veins closed off. The blood can block the retina, uh, but it also it damages the, the capillaries, the small blood vessels that deliver the blood right to the center of vision. When the blood backs up, it's like all the cars back up over, over you know, uh, Broad Street. And so the, the capillaries get damaged and also the central part of the retina no longer gets oxygen, and that's going to die off. Uh, this central retinal vein occlusion and branch retinal vein, the visual acuity isn't as bad as an artery occlusion. And actually, we can treat uh, the vein occlusions, again, the same medicines that we give uh, for uh, wet macular degeneration. Uh, again, this blood could take months to clear up. The fluid in the eye can take months to clear up. But we again, injection once a month, even for up to a year or so, to try and salvage uh, some uh, vision where they can you know, drive for that eye. The risk factors being a man over the age of 65 and high blood pressure. What happens is high blood pressure increases the thickness of the small arteries. And then the retina, the arteries cross over the retina, just like Broad Street <coughs> crosses over Summit Avenue. And when the artery gets thicker with this muscular coat, it compresses on the very soft vein and closes it off. Uh, so that's how that mechanism occurs. Again, here's a branch retinal vein occlusion on the superior retina. 
and we see some white spots. Those are signs of ischemia, cotton wool spots. And again, lower down there is a little dark area, that cherry red spot um, there. That is uh, what happens is with the branch vein occlusion. Again, the arteries, I mean, the veins and the capillaries are damaged. And they leak fluid, and the fluid drips down uh, into the center of the retina. And again, the wet sponge doesn't see well, a dry sponge sees clearly. Sometimes like your roof is leaking with drain and the rain is uh, dripping in. Again, we can laser this area to decrease the uh, fluid and also give injections to the eye to maintain it. Um, attached retina, I'll just talk about briefly because I didn't really do that much. Uh, but the important thing to notice is the gel of the eye makes up 80% of the volume of the eye. It's 99% water, but it is a jelly. It's gooey. It's attached to the retina all the way around. Uh, what happens is with the time, usually pretty much everybody over the age of 60, 65, the posterior vitreous back here will separate from the retina. I describe it as your wallpaper paper peels off the wall slowly. What do you see? You see the back surface of the jelly, which you can see floaters. It could be spots, spider webs, lace. You look up, they float up. You look down, they float down. You notice them more when you read. If you're looking at a uh, walking on the sidewalk on a bright sunny day, you can see those floaters. Um, but you want to make sure is that the jelly is attached to the retina, and most of the time it pulls away freely from the retina. Maybe like one in eight people, the adhesion of the jelly to the retina is too strong, but actually gives the retinal tear. So all of a sudden it's elevated. And then what happens is the jelly gets underneath that and further detaches the retina. That could take weeks or longer, or it can even just take some days. And retina detachment is an emergency because once the retina is detached over 48 hours, it's not going to work well at all. And that's true of emergencies. So here's an example on the right. If you look at three o'clock, that is like, well, it's a little U-shape. That's what we call a horseshoe tear because the jelly, the vitreous is pulled away and its attachment to the retina has been strong enough for it to yank part of that retina out. And all of a sudden that there's a hole there and the red jelly can now get underneath and slowly detach it. That's, so here we have a detachment. Actually, it's the inferior retina. And that white area is the area that's detached and it's really uh, getting very, very close to the center of vision. So you want to repair that by uh, removing the fluid from underneath the retina and tamponading with air uh, and uh, laser. Here's a sign of it. Again, you can see the optic nerve and there's, there's folds in the retina are just an inferior detachment that now is just involved in the center of vision. This person has, you know, no vision severely, a big uh, veil of uh, blackness overwards. And so this is an emergency. Uh, cranial nerve palsies are double vision. Here's a third nerve palsy where the, the right eye uh, can't look up. Here's the sixth nerve palsy where the left eye can't look out. And these are ischemic events. Uh, we don't really call them strokes. Uh, they do recover a lot, but uh, double vision is annoying. So what we do is we try and ultimately patch the eyes. So we, uh, you patch the bad eye one day and you patch the good eye the other day. You really can't walk around with a patch. And double vision is very, very hard to deal with because you see two of everything and your depth perception is thrown off. But uh, really, there's really not much workup to do for this. And I say diabetics have a greater risk of, of these uh, palsies and people with hypertension. And uh, I see them all the time. And again, they usually recover within you know, two or three months. Uh, uh, we did enough for the retina scheme by got neuropathy. I think briefly, that's another quick sudden loss of vision in older people. Uh, not, it's not due to uh, embolism, just to uh, lack of blood flow, just hardening of the arteries. Uh, that can be an emergency, sometimes associated with uh, scalp tenderness, uh, uh, hip and shoulder pain, uh, uh, which is you know, scalp tenderness to be temporal arteritis, uh, uh, so forth, temporal arteritis again. Uh, that's an emergency, usually people over the age of uh, 65. Uh, it can affect vision in one eye, but also the other eye. So it's very important to diagnose that. I think it has sort of vague protein manifestations, fatigue, malaise, uh, again, scalp tenderness, um, so forth. Headache, malaise, night sweats, I don't know about that. But jaw, you know, jaw claudication, polymyalgia rheumatica, which I was trying to remember, that can be associated with hip and uh, shoulder pain. And so we do a blood test for the sedimentation rate and to see if that's elevated, you're treated with uh, oral steroids. And also we, we biopsy the temporal artery in your scalp. Uh, because if it's positive, we commit you to about six months of steroid treatments. Uh, that all steroids, yep. 
Mount of Vision. That's that. Actually, that's pretty good enough talk, right? Perfect. I'm going to boring people run up, right? Uh, any questions? Okay, Dr. Uh, my question is post cataracts uh, surgery. Can you explain the procedure and what happens? Oh, uh, the the lens is surrounded by a, a capsule, it's like saran wrap. So we retain the posterior capsule, which will, will hold and stabilize the implant. And there is a few cataract cells that remain. We can get almost all of them out. There are a few that remain. And for whatever reason, they slide across it, uh, into the visual axis and they swell with water. They actually divide and grow. And it's like a thin film. So all of a sudden you get symptoms like I get glare, you get blurry vision. You think, boy, my cataract is growing back again. Well, it's not. It's a thin film. And what we can do is you don't have to go back to the operating room. We want to laser that because that thin film will, will uh, deflect and, and block the light uh, rays of light from being focused properly on the retina. So we can laser that and create a nice opening, maybe like three or four millimeters, and your symptoms are gone. And it doesn't grow back. No. Do it in the office. You give some drops to take for a few days afterwards and you drive home yourself. And it occurs maybe what less than 10% of cataract patients. Great. Okay, let's go online. Next. online. Bill Tittle. Uh, thank you very much for an interesting talk. Um, I had, uh, I was using, I was on high amounts of, of uh, prednisone and I developed a cataract in one of my eyes. And it got to the point where decision was made to replace the lens with a synthetic lens. So I got one synthetic lens and one real lens. And they're really different. And, and for 10, 15 years, I've been trying to get uh, through glasses. Uh, um, and my question is, uh, my synthetic lens is, is never as good as the real lens. Should I get a second synthetic lens if I have a, a, a need to? You mean in your unoperated eye? Um, the I gather, I gather you have an implant in one eye. Yes. And, and uh, your natural lens in the other eye. That's right. So you want to say, well, do I, should I get an implant cataract surgery in my, in my uh, natural lens eye, my, my good eye, yes. just to match and balance out Yes. One that has the implant. Uh, I wouldn't. Which is your better eye? The natural one. Yeah. So why would you want to operate on your better eye? Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you, doctor. That was very interesting. I have a question, which is, I always get squeamish when I hear about injections being given into the eye. Is that painful? Uh, what we do is we uh, numb the eye up topical drops and give a little injection of a little lidocaine just under the surface of the conjunctiva. Uh, it's not like you feel nothing, but it occurs so quickly. And I think people have you know a little uh, fear of it going into it. But again, this is something that's done every month for several months and uh, people get used to it and they get it done, especially when you see the improvement in your vision. Yeah, thank you. Online, uh, John Tomaszewski. Uh, thank you, doctor. That was a very good, um, scary <laughs> talk. Um, uh, two questions. The first one is, is, is a lot of this um, or most of this covered by Medicare? The yes. things you were talking? Yes. And the second one is, I noticed my eyes are getting dry lately. Um, and you've talked me into getting a, 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 an eye exam soon. But is that something that is bad if you use eye drops uh, once or twice a day? Uh, no, not at all. Usually a significant dry eye, you need drops more than three or four times a day. There's a deal with the counter tear drops. So you want to see, you know, is it mild, moderate, or is it worse? What's the cause of it? Can we treat the cause to make it better? Uh, so a quick uh, expedient is just to get over the counter eye drops and use them. But people with- uh, I'm sorry, over the counter eye drops. Like your saline, your uh, tears natural, your refreshed tears. There are zillions of them. Uh, yeah, and I know I notice in the morning that they're really dry, and I really have to use the eye drops. So that's common amongst older people, I guess. 
Sure. So uh, you want to see, you know, what's the cause of it? Can we treat the causes? And how we treat it? Do we need uh, drop prescription drops? Do we need uh, uh, ocular, you know, medicine drops, or we just need over-the-counter drops? Do we need short-term treatment? Maybe you know, two or three weeks of uh, let's say a topical steroid uh, to help you, or do we need something like prostasis, which is long-term, every day, uh, for years? Thank you, doctor. Sure. In the room. Uh, could you explain about optical migraine and what it is and what it means? Sure. Uh, usually I see that in younger patients. I usually see it in much younger patients, but ocular migraine is, I call it, it's, it's uh, you see visual phenomena, usually towards your ear, it's like scintillating lights zigzag lines, heat waves. I call it, as, a, as a, I describe it as a kaleidoscope effect. It can last five minutes. It usually doesn't last more than 30 minutes. A, you know, maybe like 10, 15% of the time, that's it, goes away, no headache. The vast majority, you get the headache afterwards. It could last hours, even a few days. You can run in families, I see it more in, in younger women. Uh, there's a family history of it. Uh, what happens when you see the the, the Scotoma, you see the, the uh, kaleidoscope. It, uh, there's either there's a constriction of the blood supply to the eye itself, if it's in one eye. It can also be in both eyes, usually in the upper right or upper left. And that's more the, the occipital lobe of the brain, the visual, visual part of our brain, and the, the, the artery spasms. We're not sure why. Then after, uh, that will release. So uh, all of a sudden, there's more blood that goes to the eye. The scotoma goes away. The dilation of the artery causes the headache. The patient doesn't like the headache. I don't like the scotoma because you don't want to have a potentially a stroke uh, and so forth. So uh, what we do is, you know, a lot of it's a history. You know, if, if somebody gets one once a week or every, you know, two weeks, uh, often, what you try and do is you try and prevent the scotoma. So what we do is you try and prevent the constriction. So what I do is I give them an inhaler as Maddox did. It dilates the arteries. So once, once someone gets that early sign of the uh, zigzag lines, I say, take two puffs, wait 10 minutes later, take two puffs and it's not away. And usually that treatment usually just knocks it out pretty quickly. And usually you don't get the headache. If you take the inhaler, once you get the headaches, it's gonna make the headache worse because it dilates the arteries. But it's really, really, we wanna prevent, I don't like the ischemia, the lack of oxygen. The patient doesn't like the headache and they're more concerned about the headache. I'm more concerned about the visual changes. So again, uh, 10, 50% of the time, they, especially older people, they don't get the headache. So you know, there's really not much work if you do for it, but you try and say, well, if you get them once a week, you gotta take the inhaler. Uh, I, haven't had any, I haven't had a patient get a stroke on it. I've had some patients who've had strokes before from migraines, much younger patients with severe forms, but uh, it just depends on the frequency whether you get the inhaler treatment or not. But it really works well. And if you can just break the cycle of your migraines, that's great. Can I, can I ask a quick follow-up? I, I actually get that condition, and uh, I've been getting it since I was uh, in my 20s, and yeah. it happens once every several years. There's no headache. It's just this ocular thing. It right. starts in the corner and works its way across, and 20 minutes later, you know, uh, I, could, yeah. I couldn't be driving. You know, I just have to wait, and it goes away. It's yeah. about a half an hour. So the question is, should I seek medical attention when that happens? No. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, Miguel, online. Uh, th thank you very much, Doctor. Your fascinating talk sounds to me like you're reading my medical record. <laughs> <laughs> I've had cataracts and glaucoma, and uh, about uh, two years ago, I had a CRVO, central retinal vein occlusion, in my right eye. I've been getting shots every four to six weeks for the last two years. Um, recovered pretty well. I still have a little bit of a waviness in my right eye when I look at a line that hasn't gone away completely. So my questions to you are uh, about the CRVO. Uh, can that recover completely? Will the retina, that line ever go away? Are the shots, temp are the shots uh, forever or do they end after a while or what? what's... Uh, Tell me, you know, about the recovery prospects for CRVO. Well, if your retina doctor is still giving you injections, that, that has to mean you still have fluid in the retina. 
So once the retina is dry, there's really no need to get the injections anymore. Even if the retina is dry, your, your retina can still have wrinkly uh, vision, distorted vision, because the retina, it's like taking a rug and bunching it up. Uh, and even though you, you pull it taut, it's still never perfectly flat. So you can see some changes in, in this architecture of the cells of the retina may give you that. If you're still getting injections and the central retinal vein can still leak for a, a while, that means you still have active leakage and active fluid in your eye. And that's why he's giving you the injections. Is that related to the glaucoma fluid, a different fluid or? No, no. Uh, only if, glaucoma can cause a vein occlusion only if the pressure is really, really high. You know, 50, 60 millimeters of mercury. Yours, I think your vein occlusion was just unrelated to the uh, glaucoma. Okay. We're, we're approaching 11.30, so let's make this the last question. Thank you. Um, I've got the uh, M, M slur grid in my refrigerator. Uh, it's a very handy thing. I picked up something for retinology. But is there any home test for peripheral vision? That, and the first question really is, does peripheral vision vary with your physical condition, say your blood pressure or your whatever? Uh, and if, uh, and then is there a home test so you can check? You know, uh, I know they have some home tests for central, you know, the Amsler grid. You know, you know, years ago, they, they had people test it every day, once a week. And actually they realized that the patient really can't detect a change because a patient would come in and say, I don't notice any change. And then the doctor goes, yeah, yeah your retina is worse. There's more leakage there. So I'm not sure how accurate the, the Amsler grid is. Uh, the best thing is I think you know, going to the, the doctor and uh, taking his advice on how often to follow up. Uh, only if your pressure were very high, your high blood pressure would affect your central vision more than your peripheral vision. Don't forget, the peripheral vision doesn't have great acuity. You know, if you put your hand up in front of your face, you could, you could see figures, but you may not be able to pick out your friends. So the, the, the acuity is very weak and uh, uh, so forth. So it doesn't, it's really hard to test peripheral vision. Sometimes I'll see something, but I don't, I can't look at it because it's a peripheral. Right, and you just don't have great acuity then, that's all, yeah. So there's no... No test, yeah. Thank you. Doctor, thank you uh, so much for uh, a fascinating and, and very helpful talk, as you can tell from uh, all of the questions. <laughs> It's amazing given our demographic, whenever we have a medical professional here, uh, we hear of uh, all of the concerns and uh, diseases. It's what we affectionately call the, uh, the organ recital. Uh, <laughs> and uh, with that, uh, I'm going to turn to uh, George who will provide the formal thank you for the doctor. Thank you, doctor, for an interesting and informative presentation. The old guard has two ways to thank you. First, we have the certificate which we will give to you. And you will notice that it has a orchid on it. And this is because when the old guard was formed in 1930, a firm in Summit was the largest producer and distributor of orchid plants in the United States. And at that time, the old guard founders decided to adopt that as its logo. And the second way we have to thank you is with an old guard salute. <laughs> 